All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is everyone doing well? Good sessions today? Good. All right. Well, welcome. We have a, a couple other sessions this afternoon. Um, let me ask first, how many of you have signed the manifesto? Raise your, raise your hand. I looked just about, uh, about an hour and a half ago, and it, it's, it's incredible how many of you have actually gone out there and signed this. You know, companies, large companies, VMware, SAP, uh, Intuit, and a lot of disruptive companies, DocuSign, Box, you know, LeaseHawk, SnapLogic. It's, uh, it's just great to see uh, folks sort of aligning around the principles that many of you told us are what's important to the subscription economy. So check it out if you haven't checked it out already. I also just want to take a minute and thank our sponsors. We were uh, just really, uh, you know, candidly surprised and excited by how many partners in our ecosystem wanted to support this event, both technology partners as well as uh, global system integrators. Uh, so I just would like each, all of us to thank our partners uh, today for their sponsorship. So now let me get going on, on, on the next session. Um, in, in the spring, um, we worked to pull together a book. Uh, and initially we thought, well, why don't we work to pull together a book ourselves within Zora about um, just insights that we had learned from uh, the subscription economy. And then we, we decided that, no, that doesn't really make sense when we have a community of thought leaders already out there that have incredible things to say and have unique and very practical advice to share. So we worked on creating um, a book. Have you seen this book? There's a, there's a whole bunch of books. You have, you have the book. So this is the book that is actually the centerpiece of this session. Um, it is comprised, I should know the number, uh, of quite a few articles. I think it's probably about 20 different articles that were written by the community. Uh, that includes customers, it includes industry analysts, it includes partners, and um, it's really a diverse collection of perspectives on what it takes to be successful in, in the subscription economy. And so we thought, why not invite the authors here today, some of the authors, um, and participate in uh, a bit of a, of a discussion around this book and its sharing of their insights. And, um, and so I'd like to invite the panelists up here today. We actually have uh, nine different um, authors that were able to make it here today. So I'd like to invite all of them up. If they could just join me on stage. Uh, we're going to introduce them in a second. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Excellent. So um, before we begin uh, going through, I mean, I've asked each of the, the panelists to, to think about, for lack of a better word, a nugget. We kept coming back to the word nugget. And it's sort of a nugget of insight, a piece of insight that uh, they wish they had before they started down this path of the subscription economy. And so in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask each of them to get up and share that insight. And then after that, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Uh, from all of you. So as you're hearing uh, this, this, uh, these sort of brief discussions, think of the question that you might want to ask. And when you do ask uh, the question, you, know, you might want to indicate which of the panelists you'd like to ask the question to. Before I do that, though, I'd like to invite uh, Sadeep Raj to join me first. Uh, Sadeep represents Accenture. Thank you, Thank Sadeep. You. And uh, Accenture is, is one of our uh, global system integrating uh, uh, partners. And, uh, and one of the contributors of the book as well. And Sadeep and Accenture, uh, really, we were thrilled to see they, they decided to sponsor this session. So I wanted Sadeep to join me up here and just speak a little bit about uh, what you see going on in the market. I mean, one of the, the things that's um, so interesting about Accenture is that you're working with so many diverse companies across industries, enterprise companies that are in this, this transition. What are the, the trends that you see uh, going on in the in the market. Well, thanks, Brian. Well, first of all, on behalf of Accenture, we are absolutely thrilled to be sponsoring this panel. You know, this is such an important 
industry change, and we're just excited to be part of it. Um, so Brian, you were asking about trends. And uh, you know, I, I think the predominant trend is that our clients in the enterprise, this take up of the cloud solutions in this space is accelerating. You know, and, and a, a, a good example is where we've implemented Zora. Mm. And it's a telecommunications company, global in scale, but launching a new business, a new, new service. And, um, and there were three things that kind of really drove that, that shift for them. You know, first and foremost, it was speed. You know, they had this incredible drive to speed to market. They knew that that was an advantage that they had to have. And frankly, the existing systems that they had to be able to launch against would not have been able to meet this mm. time frame that we had. We did this in 12 weeks to get this system up and, up and running for them. Yeah. The, the next thing is around what we call kind of flexibility and adaptability. But it's this aspect that the subscription economy is all driven around change. And the traditional systems are so brittle that they can't bend and flex to be able to adapt to those needs. You know, they break. And so we see this kind of shift coming on. And the last thing is that there are some net new functions that frankly the, the kind of ERP and billing systems are geared around kind of the product-based models versus service-based models. And actually, so we're seeing this trend of automating some functions that are kind of very manual and ad hoc. And so we're seeing this kind of increased rigor Mm. off the back of these types of implementations. Yeah, so the, the flexibility piece in particular, you've seen the, the limitations of some of the existing systems that they have in place. I know that one example, and you've seen that again and again. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we go to places where, honestly, they're running some things in spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> Even in large companies, because what they're finding is, is they can't get those changes to map to the models that, frankly, have become ingrained over years, you yeah, know, and they, yeah. can't, they can't change it. What are, the, what are the other challenges that you've seen, too? You know, it, so you engage with these, you, you see these as trends, but what are the challenges when you actually begin to engage with them in this business transformation? You know, that's a great question. So, so first and foremost, and you guys all know this because uh, you've been hearing the themes today, but you know, honestly, it's, it's less about the technology. And you know, from Accenture, some people would be surprised to hear that, but, it, but it's actually true that actually when we're, we're looking at these these initiatives, the strategy to address a new market with a subscription-based model is something that needs enormous attention. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of fleshing out what target segments, how they respond, and so on. Then you start to figure out, well, how do you sustain it? How do you operationalize all these principles that we've been hearing about? Mm -hmm. And that comes down to this process change that many companies in the enterprise are trying to drive this, this shift. That process change is hard. Um, now, on technology, you know, for our clients, they're not moving everything to the cloud. It's a kind of hybrid model where they're, they're taking advantage of these cloud solutions, but they're having to stitch it into the fabric mm. of their IT architecture. And it's hard because what's being stretched are these governance models that are all geared towards these kind of very traditional models. And mm. so what we see is a shift of the balance for speed with these enterprise controls. And then the last thing I would say is, you know what, the, the truism is, you know, the hardest part is all the people side, mm -hmm. of course. You know, how, how hard is it to change the mindsets and behaviors, the culture that have been so ingrained around some of these constraints? That's, honestly, I'm working with a client right now, and that's their hardest thing. That's the thing that we're is spending the most. Is it a, a the mindset most shift, or is it actually just sort of the, the do you mean the talent and the experience? So, so there's a bit of both. There's some, there's yeah. some uh, skills that they need to develop. Yeah. Some of these things are a mindset, though. They're, they're kind of geared around this aspect of being able to experiment less, which mm. is really key in a subscription economy, right? The yeah. ability to kind of adapt and change, and they're not used to that kind of model. Yeah, absolutely. This iteration piece, too, is a, is a real challenge. And we're going to hear that. I'm sure yeah. a lot of my yeah. kind of co-panelists here yeah. are going to bring that out. But this yeah. iteration is, is, is something that I think is just profound. Yeah. You know, when you think about these organizations, most of the clients we work with, they work in these very... Uh, long cycles that you bake everything and then out pops the answer and then you live with that for a long while. 
we, we've changed now. That, it's a that very, model very is dynamic, now sort of dynamic. Model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, listen, Saeed, I appreciate you sponsoring this event. Thank you. You'll get a chance too with the nugget. You're at the end. You get the I'll, last I'll nugget. I'll save up for yeah. it. <laughs> you got to work on it. So here's what we're going to do. Um, thank you again to Saeed. Um, the All of the, the uh, panelists have contributed to this book. And what I've asked each of them to do is to speak to um, either learning from their article or uh, another insight that they wish to sort of impart on this audience, either from their own experience or something they wish they had been told before they went down this path. And so we're going to take just three minutes per panelist to go through and then open it up for, for Q&A. So Bill, do you want to uh, begin? Sure. Thank you, Brian. Yep, sure. I've got notes here just because uh, my brain's a little frazzled at the end of the day here. Um, well, the topic that, uh, that the nugget that I'm going to um, focus on is around pricing. And really, the, the fact is, in the subscription economy, um, because we can iterate so quickly, because we're not mired in the ERP systems that are so structured, we can iterate. And specifically around pricing, um, you know, define a pricing model quickly and be ready to change it frequently. Um, another way to say it is pricing is an ongoing experiment. Um, <clears throat> at NCR Silver, we have a very simple um, set of products. We sell hardware probably 10 pieces that range from cash drawers and iPad stands and printers so that a retailer can sort of have an established point of sale presence. Um, and we sell software for that, the services for that. Um, we, we charge one-time fees, we do recurring billing, um, we have um, usage that we're charging. We've got additional devices that, that we charge. So I, my first device is included in the monthly service. My additional devices that I activate, I, I charge on some level, of, uh, some pricing model that um, usually is usage based. I've got flat rates, I've got tiered. Um, we're including the first month free. So um, if, if you want to sign up, you can get the first month free. And, and so we take all that stuff into consideration and, and it adds some complexity. You know, we're, we're, uh, but luckily Zora can support all that and, and um, is, is very um, nimble as we want to go through and iterate and change those, those approaches. Um, the way that we go to market is, is um, a couple different ways and, and it's changed over the past couple 18 months. Uh, we are direct. We have MSRP. You can call us. We can, um, we can uh, sell you sil silver over the phone. We have a web presence that um, we're a uh, commerce component that we're bringing online here shortly. We also sell through channels. Uh, we've got a, um, large merchant processors out there who sell credit card processing to these small retailers. Uh, we work with them directly to um, have them, um, them sell our solution into their existing install base as well as their new customers. We also have smaller partners who are basically resellers of these merchant processors. And um, we work with them in a, in a different way, but similar way, um, just because they're a smaller um, organization. We also are in retail. So you can go to the store and buy NCR Silver Bundle um, at Staples and, and soon other places. So we, we've got, um, in each one of those scenarios, we've got different pricing scenarios, different pricing models. Um, and we have to make sure that we keep track of all those for each of the different um, channels so that uh, they tend not, they, they sort of understand what, what the value is for each one of those. So a customer who has a partner come and sell it to them, they can understand why they'd want to buy from the partner and the value add that a partner could provide versus coming direct to, to NCR. Um, so we, we've started, when we started NCR Silver, we tried a bunch of different pricing models. We've um, we've tinkered with it. We've continued to, to iterate and continued to um, modify it based on feedback from our customers, from our partners. Um, we're not wildly changing you know, the game, um, but, but we're definitely um, adjusting along the way and, and trying to make sure that the model that we have out there is, is understandable for our customers. So when you think about it, as you add hardware into a SaaS, into a SaaS solution, things start to get complex. So do I need the hardware? Yes or no? You, you don't, but you sort of do if you want integrated credit. Okay, well then which hardware components do I need to get? These and those, and so we try and bundle them up. Um, but anyway, so we want to make sure that the customer understands the value of what they're getting, as well as um, what they're buying, the pricing makes sense to them. You also need to make sure that um, we 
do not have channel conflicts uh, based on our pricing models. So if we've got a deal out in Staples and our partners see that and it's different than the deal they get, you know, they're, they're not um, stupid. They're going to go come back to us and say, hey, well, how come these guys have this? And so you got to make sure that, that when you're doing your pricing that you take, you look at all your um, channels and make sure that you've got uh, a justification for all that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that, is that we're, we're dealing with discounts and promotions and that kind of stuff. And um, that plays into this um, potential conflict uh, along the way with the different channels. But just know that um, the benefit of Zora is that you can make all these changes very easily. Know that it's, it's great to get out there and start trying pricing. Um, move quickly on a, on a plan and just know that you're going to end up changing those prices um, frequently and, and the tools support that. So it's great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Bill. And, uh, and I should just add the book, in the article that Bill wrote in the book is, I think, the, the one article about selling hardware and software in a subscription model. So I know we have in, an increasing number of customers that have services tethered to hardware devices. Uh, that might be of interest to you. Next up is, is Kathy. She's no foreigner to the stage. She, both of you were up with, with Teen this morning. Kathy from ExploreNet. Thank you. Okay. Flip the, okay. Get your, oh wait, did I, did I blank it? I hit the wrong button. Here we go. Okay, so the article that uh, I contributed uh, with my colleague Portia uh, in the book is called Streamlining Processes to Support Business Growth and Improve Efficiencies. So um, just a little context. Uh, so ExploreNet, uh, I probably heard a little bit about this, but we are a, a broadband uh, internet provider in Canada uh, with over 200,000 customers. And we are very um, acquisition oriented or um, uh, growth oriented right now. So there's not a day that doesn't go by that we're not talking about uh, installations and how many customers that we added the day before. So um, we often talk at, at ExploreNet about our order to cash processes or um, our customer lifecycle process. And that process is uh, the lead uh, uh, generation of leads through our inside sales folks and our dealers. Uh, the selling, so the actual uh, customer uh, sale, to the installation, uh, to the overall customer support, billing, payment, uh, cancellation, suspensions, and uh, the overall collection process. So that's kind of our order to cash customer lifecycle process. Uh, the lead, sale, and um, installation process is very similar to the price acquire um, nine keys that uh, has been uh, communicated uh, to everyone today. So that's a bit of the context. So acquisition oriented, um, very um, uh, process focused. So uh, the article in the book speaks to a project that we uh, implemented a couple years ago uh, that replaced our entire order to cash process. Um, and we realized uh, early on in the project that uh, it, it's one thing to just um, replace your software, but if you don't think through the processes, and actually Michelle, my colleague, earlier today did a presentation and a breakout and talked about the fact that we, when we first started the project, we, we started gathering requirements and realized that, you know, the business didn't really know um, exactly how they wanted to optimize the processes going forward, and we actually took a step back and said we need to go back to the basics and do some process mapping and really think through strategically uh, what we want to, to achieve so that when we put this new foundation in of processes and, and systems, it's, it's going to allow us to grow uh, and scale and be flexible and acquire customers and so on. So um, that was the um, sort of premise of the, uh, of the article in the book about the process development. Now there is a very specific aha moment that we, we had in the book or in the project that's mentioned in the book where we, we realized that the entire uh, event was a journey, not a destination. Uh, we knew that at the end of the project, uh, we would be far along our journey in that we would have our core foundation in, but that it would continue to evolve and we needed to make sure that that core of processes and systems would allow us to continue on with our journey. Uh, in fact, we had a, just as an aside, we had a, a name the system contest uh, during the project and there were folks that wanted to name our system journey. Uh, I actually didn't want to do that, but uh, uh, we ended up uh, naming it Ally uh, to represent our ally or friend. Um, but uh, there was a lot of folks that wanted to name a journey because they realized this is a journey. It's not going to be over when we implement. So that was the gist of the, the, um, the article. Um, 
the, um, the results kind of speak to themselves in terms of the, the um, acquisition focus of um, the project and, and the go forward. We actually have had 40% year over year growth uh, this year versus last year as a result of these processes and systems that we have put in, uh, although we, and, and all the technology that we've uh, also put in. But again, we continue to evolve the application and we have that core foundation uh, that, um, that you need to be able to do that. So in summary, the article is, is primarily focused on the process piece of the project, but it does give you a bit of context about you know, why we did do the project. We talk a lot about the fact that we uh, made sure that in order to have the right optimized processes, we've involved a lot of the internal employees in the project. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, it was important to have those that were gonna own the uh, environment at the uh, end to be involved in, in, in moving it forward. And if we had to backfill them, we did. So the, the article does talk a bit about that as well as the process piece and uh, some lessons learned that you know, we learned along the way um, with the outcome being a, a great uh, platform. So my nugget, which is kind of a, I like big nuggets, so, um, <laughs> so it's quite a run on sentence actually, but I was quite proud of myself the other day when I wrote it, because I have everything there. Uh, so in, but it really does speak to what we were trying to achieve. So process, scalability, agility, flexibility, visibility to the data, and efficiency are part of our journey, and it wasn't a one-time destination. And in the end, they were enablers to our ongoing order to cash success, of which a scalable cloud solution has provided the backbone. I think that I should get marketing dollars for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, that is um, the, the ExploreNet story. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> The, the process is a journey, not a destination, absolutely. Um, I'd like to introduce now Marissa Macy, controller at Bizarre Voice, and, uh, and oop, oop, I'm dropping your mic. Um, I, one of my favorite articles, frankly, in, in the book, because it just talks about the changing role of finance in subscription businesses. Um, Marissa? We were, we were joking about microphones before. We, should have, yeah, we, were, we shouldn't have done that. That's all right. That no, it all works sense. well. So uh, the article in the book is talking about the role of the controller and how uh, in a subscription economy, you really get the opportunity to get out behind the desk and speak to uh, and spe work with everyone across the business. All right, is that working? All right. So um, interesting that uh, Brian, I think, or team pointed out that I think 80% of the attendees here are actually not in finance. So this is really a real, real time getting me a chance to, <coughs> giving me a chance to get out and, and speak to everyone that, uh, some non-finance folks. One thing I'll note is that I, um, I'm originally from Chicago. I went to school in Michigan. I moved to, lived mostly in California. I've only been in Austin a year, but I'm pretty sure y'all is gonna slip out somewhere a couple times in this presentation. It's kind of infectious. Uh, the Nugget really talked about invoice and collections team, and so um, you really find out that um, they really are an extension of your customer service function, and um, whether the, making sure that the customers actually understand the invoice. So as you're trying, to, as, as, as your back office collections team, who I'm sure most folks don't spend a lot of time thinking about, they're the ones that are trying to. If you have any kind of confusion with your customer, they're the ones that are explaining it to them, and the, the bill is kind of that first and, and first experience they have with the company, particularly if they have um, any kind of implementation process. And so really making sure that your, your, um, your, your full end-to-end -end team revenue through your collections team is really part of keeping that customer happy. Uh, so recently, we um, have been, as, as any company is, uh, laser focused on churn. And about three months ago, we started this uh, escalation process, going through all of our accounts that were slow to pay and you know sorted through the ones that just had messy PO processes etc and really found customers who were saying I don't understand the invoice I'm waiting for the sales guy he promised me an amendment I'm supposed to be getting concession I'm not paying you till this is all sorted out and um, and, and we started escalating that and you know those of you that deal with sales coverage or customer service and trying to make sure that every customer has an owner um, we quickly found that we had some customers that when we started calling around to say, this one's unhappy, who do we talk to? That's when we found out that, well, kind of nobody owned that customer. Well, that was Joe and he left last week and we haven't really handed it off to Bob. And so it really is an opportunity for you to understand if you've got a gap or really understand that you might have an unhappy customer. It's pretty basic, happy customers pay, unhappy customers do not. 
And so if you can, um, I would encourage all of you to um, go find your controller, go find your finance team, and see what kind of uh, uh, information they can bring. Uh, the other way to think about this is, if you're here, so much of what we talked about, the nine keys, is really about getting visibility, transparency, 360 customer views. A lot of the partners out there are talking about that. What we're really going to try to implement, and we just are a new Gainsight customer, I'm not sure if they're in here, but we're very excited about that. And one of the areas that we're going to add to this is just having a red flag on customers not paying, customer has a concern, so that anybody that's connected with the customer can really understand, um, can, can really get a, a yet another red flag to there's some customer satisfaction issues. So just basically, just you know, work with your teams. We, uh, when I was, I was at Salesforce for four years, and certainly lived through the you know, somewhat increase in churn. And our, renew, our uh, collections team really started focusing on the auto-renew customers. Um, we put in some early, um, uh, some advanced notice of renewals, and really trained the teams to, uh, to talk to the customers, and found out, in fact, that we were, had we not been giving them advanced notice, we were missing an opportunity to upsell. Oh, I'm so glad I knew I was renewing. I really wanted four more licenses. Can you do that for me? And so just being able to facilitate the whole, everybody to be a salesperson, everybody to, if not, be able to just process that order right there for four more licenses, but get them immediately connected to someone that could, just really, um, really helped uh, take care of a lot of customers. So anyway, hope this was helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And uh, I'm Sarah Marissa. Next, Christine Dover, uh, Research Director at IDC. Christine Great. and her colleague uh, both were involved in, I think, contributing. No, to this Amy book. wrote Amy it. Amy wrote it. Amy Connery, my colleague, wrote the article. Um, key considerations for success with a subscription business model. IDC is a market research firm and industry analyst, so we spend all our time looking at the software industry. So companies like Zora and going to conferences and hearing what people have to say. Um, it's been interesting for me as we look through what's happening and the change of moving into the cloud, it's such an opportunity for software companies, but also every business who's working with them to change their business model and transform what they're doing. So my nugget, if uh, yep, there you're you gonna move on, there, there it go. is. So on-premise, sort of the highest possible price in the first buy. I grew up in the software industry and that's what we were about. Let's get as much money out of that customer the first time we sell to them. And then generally it was, see ya. And uh, come back a few years later and say, uh, give us some more money. And you didn't really hear about the customer success and the customer satisfaction. In fact, you were lucky if you had 20% of your customers respond to your customer satisfaction surveys. So that's really changing and we're hearing that over and over and over again as we talk to cloud companies. You see the customer satisfaction rates now are, and customer retention rates are in the high 90s. You saw that with Zor's numbers this morning and that's really consistent in this cloud world. It's about keeping customers. So as you move to subscription, it's about that long-term customer relationship and how do I get them to buy more and more and more over time? Um, and it may be just what they need at the, the moment. They don't have to buy a lot to start with, but keep going. And one of the things I look at at IDC is I look at the back office system, so financial accounting and order management, all of those things that are important to controllers and, and uh, to all sorts of businesses. But I also look at commerce. And commerce is important to me because it's not just about retail. I look at it at software across all sorts of industries. Every business that's out there, including the public sector, you know, the government, they've, everybody's got something to sell. So everybody needs a commerce kind of engine. And subscription has a place in every sort of business, not just software. Again, it's an opportunity to transform what you're doing, what you're selling, what you're doing with your customers. And a little story is, um, I belong to way too many wine clubs. And uh, I know a lot of other, other people do too. But um, I was talking to a winer, winemaker a number of years ago up in Southern Oregon, and he, he transformed his business. Too bad he didn't have Zora at the time. But um, what he found is that he was relying on people showing up at the winery to buy bottles of wine, maybe in a few restaurants. How many people are going to Southern Oregon to find him? And he was having a cash flow problem. So he reinvented his business and created a wine club. And at that time, there really weren't 
many, if all, of these wine clubs around. And what he found is that, oh, now people are getting wine from me showing up on their doorstep four times a year or six times a year, whatever he chose. He has something to put in front of them, and now he's got add-on sales. And his cash flow just went through the roof. So it's a really transformative opportunity for not just digital assets and things that we have to sell, but also things that you don't think about as possibly being, um, it is a product that I'm selling, but I can turn it into a subscription. So thank you. Thank you, Christine. Dennis Pombrian from Beagle Research. Hey, everybody. I can't see anything. Yeah, the, the lights are bright, yeah. <laughs> so I've got a real simple idea. Um, but because I am an analyst, I will try to complicate it. Um, <laughs> maybe later. Maybe later. Simple idea is that the subscription economy has spawned the subscription culture. Now, you might say, well, so what? What's the difference between the two? Well, the subscription economy, as you know, and I know, I was with Teen at the beginning, um, the subscription economy is something we've been pushing for the last five years, right? We've been trying to get it into the mindset of the public. Well, guess what? I mean, if, if you listen to the keynote today, if you came to the CEO session that I, I moderated, you discovered that, you know what, we're there. We're there. N nobody, nobody has to go out and aggressively sell subscriptions or, or say, gee, it's, it's, you know, it's different, it's, it's a little better, this, that, or the other thing. People get it. So today, we have this budding subscription culture. And what I mean by that is that you, all of you, and lots of people who aren't here, have trained the marketplace, have trained customers to think in terms of being subscribers. So what, you might say? Well, suppose you're a vendor, and suppose you're not offering subscriptions. Guess what? Your marketplace has changed. Your marketplace is now demanding things that may not make a lot of sense to you. Your marketplace is asking for flexible pricing, flexible product configuration. Why do I have to buy this all at once? I don't want all these pieces. I just want that thing. If you're a vendor that doesn't offer subscriptions and you haven't been trained on what the importance of subs subscriptions are to your customers, you're now at a competitive disadvantage. You, the people in this audience, and people like you have a decided competitive advantage in the markets that you play in because you get it. You understand customers as subscribers. You understand what they, what they want and how to deliver it to them. And the, the nine keys that we talked about this morning, that Teen talked about, I see those as the nine cultural imperatives of this new culture. So I want to say congratulations to you because you figured it out. I'm sure many of you went through uh, the, the, the maturation process and figured out eight or nine of the things that Teen talked about in the keys this morning. You figured it out for yourself. You're way ahead of the game. Congratulations. Welcome to the subscription culture. By the way, the subscription economy isn't going to go anywhere. It's just, it's just that the culture is, is an offshoot, and it's a way to, to deal with some of the complexity that now a broader market is bringing to bear on the subscription economy. Hope that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Um, the next two uh, uh, panelists and, and authors actually wrote about um, metrics and about analytics. I think Matt uh, from Scout Analytics uh, is next. And he wrote a book about the new analytics discipline for the subscription economy. Matt? Hello. Hello. I'm Matt Shanahan. I am a co-founder at Scout Analytics. We provide recurring revenue management solutions to help maximize customer lifetime value. That said, the nugget that I want to share does have to do with two of the nine keys, specifically around measurement and iteration, right? So how you iterate. The nugget also is the basis by which we founded Scout. And it's simply this. Customers are only willing to pay for what they actually consume or use. And it's that simple. And the reason it's that simple is if a customer doesn't use your service, they don't get any value. And if they don't use your service, they're not going to renew. They don't get a return on investment. 
And so usage really becomes critical. Matter of fact, your revenue and your profits become dependent on customer usage. And Teen touched on this being that bilateral relationship between the customers and, and the providers. And it starts there, right? If they're not getting value, that's going to be an issue. So in the su subscription economy, measuring usage in the context of a value proposition becomes critical. Knowing your value proposition, being able to track the value you deliver, and being able to transparently charge based on the value is what retains customer relationships and what grows them, right? And the Internet of Things makes it possible to measure usage of any product or service. So there's no reason not to get that information. And once you have the ability to measure usage in the context of a value proposition, you know when and how to engage your customers to drive more value. Additionally, as soon as you're starting to measure usage, you can start to iterate. What changes to your customer engagement process? What changes to your rate plans cause usage to go up? Right? Will changing from one metric to another on your charge plans create more value for your customers? Will it create more usage? Ultimately, that's what you're trying to do. So whether it's in customer success and trying to figure out, gosh, that, that new process we implemented, did that change usage? Did it drive revenue? So measuring and iterating in customer success, measuring and iterating on your rate plans, measuring and iterating on your campaigns will all be the ways that you track and understand that. So in the subscription economy, where customers only pay for what they actually use, your ability to measure and monetize that usage becomes critical. Great, thank you. And uh, Joel, you also wrote an article about uh, metrics. Joel York. So I'd like to uh, thank Zora for having me here. I enjoyed uh, participating in the Accelerate book. Uh, my section was on metrics. And I'm going to work my way up to my, my nugget uh, quickly <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, I want to give a little bit of a background on it. Because the, you know, we, we've heard a lot of words like long-term customer relationships and iterate. And for you know, a dyed-in-the-wool software SaaS CMO like myself, this is a whole new world. Because I came from the, you know, what did you do for me this quarter enterprise mm -hmm. software type of mindset. And this idea of long-term relationships uh, is not only a great idea, it's, it just makes life better for everybody, but it actually changes the whole approach to the business, if you think about it. And, it, and it, all of a sudden, the role of metrics take on a much more important uh, aspect because of the predictability, because of the recurring aspect of it. So some of you may uh, be as old as I am and may even remember the total quality movement from back in the, uh, the 80s. And it was all about you know, long-term relationships with vendors, long-term relationships with customers in order to improve your business processes, in order to uh, improve predictability. And that's why metrics and tools like Zuora are so important in the subscription economy because you really can focus on operational excellence and improvements through iteration because you've got this level of predictability. So my particular nugget uh, is very relevant to the Bay Area because everybody in the Bay Area that's in the SaaS space or in any space for that matter in the tech space is obsessed with growth. It's all about growth. And this particular nugget and even the, the whole series uh, that's in the Accelerate book is really a set of rules of thumb. And it comes from this predictability. And the whole thing, for me, originated in a boardroom where I was, at the time, not only CMO but head of sales. And one of our investors said, I think we really need to worry about getting our bookings rate up. And my reaction was, my god, we're already growing at 70% per <laughs> year. That's pretty good. I mean, we all like it to be better than that. And we're in a subscription business. Shouldn't the money just keep piling up year after year because you know, we keep selling more? And that's what sent me off on kind of this SaaS metrics journey. And the big discovery is that churn is the bane of the subscription economy. Churn is like the constant enemy. So my nugget is this. You know, if you're obsessed with growth, there's one number that you should keep in mind all the time. And that's what I call your, your growth ceiling. And that's just your bookings rate your acquisition rate divided by your percentage churn rate. So for example, if you're booking $10 million a year in new revenue and you've got a churn rate of 20%, then the biggest your company can ever be is $50 million, 
ever, unless you change one of those two numbers. And the reason for that is it's really simple. Just back out the math. Let's say you're doing $50 million, and you have a churn rate of 20%. That means you're churning $10 million, and you're booking $10 million, which means your growth is zero. So, you know, for all of us uh, metrics obsessed guys, another kind of sub nugget is you actually have exactly one customer lifetime to change your existence. If you want to change that trajectory, you've got to change the turn number or increase the booking rate if you want to move the ceiling to a new level. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Joel. Very relevant. Steve? Steve Woda, CEO of, uh, of You Know. What? One ahead here. How many parents do we have out there? A bunch of them. Good. Well, then you'll like what my company does. And all of the rest of you, I assume you're uh, responsible adults in the life of uh, a kid somewhere, a neighbor, an aunt, an uncle, something like that. A couple of years ago, I had a 14-year-old nephew who um, friended somebody on the internet, um, and he turned out to be an online predator. So we started a company called You Know, and You Know creates and empowers smart tools that connect and protect digital families. And our flagship product is a, pro, uh, a product, a parental intelligence service um, that makes it easier for uh, digital parents to uh, parent their kids and by definition to then keep those kids safe online and on the mobile phone. We sell direct to consumers via a consumer brand at youknowkids.com. Um, but we also sell through a bunch of channel partners. We, private label, white label, the parental intelligence service for Comcast, and a few identity theft companies, and desktop security folks, and home security folks, and direct sales organizations. So we have a kind of a, turns out to be kind of a pretty complex uh, business in many ways with respect to subscription. My nugget, actually, and why do I say that? Because uh, our, our nugget is all about um, something that a fellow who uh, was an investor in my first company shared with me early on. He was the co-founder of Capital One, a fellow by the name of Nigel Morris. And he, he shared the, the, the secret for Capital One success was to <coughs> test, learn, adapt, repeat again and again and again. Test, learn, adapt, repeat again and again and again. And, and the reason for that is because we really have no idea what the hell we're doing. I mean, if we're all honest about it, right? <laughs> and we, we, we create services that we think are a good idea, right? I had a nephew fell victim to a bad guy. So we think we have it right. We create features or tools that we think are, are going to be helpful. Um, we think we do the pricing right based on some educated guesses, some research. Um, but we really have no idea what the right price is, what the features are that customers really are going to utilize, what the thing should look like, what the button should look like, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the only way to get better and better and better is to test, learn, adapt, repeat again and again and again. And the faster you do the again and again and again, the faster you get better and better. So that's our lesson uh, from our company at UNOW, and I hope it's helpful for you too. So. Great. Thank you, Steve. That, uh, the focus on iteration is, is, uh, is very strong on the panel, isn't it? It's learning, trying things, testing, and, and adapting. It's a great, great nugget. And Sadeep. Thanks, Brian. Sure. So um, my, my nugget is the subscription economy is underpinned by the nonstop customer experience. And this is a, it's an area I'm actually really passionate about. I'll try and keep it to a nugget. Um, you know, if you hear the theme throughout you know, what we're talking about here today, a lot of this is about the subscription economy and these customer relationships of how central and important they are to be able to th uh, allow us to thrive. And when it, well, what is a relationship? It's really your customer experience, right? It's, it's the sum of all the interactions that you have with the organization, with their partners, good or bad. And it turns out that that journey of all these customer interactions, there are these moments of truth. It really makes a difference at a specific point in time how good or bad you are. And, and the kind of paradox is, is for most organizations, this customer experience just happens. It just kind of happens. And we, we look at it retrospectively. And what the leading companies are doing is that they actually define what do they want that customer experience to be. They proactively think about it, define, 
how across all these different channels, the partners and, and all the different touch, what do they want that experience to be? And then they, having defined it, they can execute against it and track against how they're doing against it. And so, you know, this is kind of profound to actually map this uh, customer experience. The issue is, is it's changing. The customer experience used to be like a funnel, a sequential process from a customer going through discovery, then consideration, evaluation, then they buy something, purchase, and then they use it. Well, you know, in the, in the regular world, actually, that's changing now. It's not that model anymore. It's a continuous loop. It's a constant process by which customers are buying, evaluating, considering, and so on with the products they're using. Now, think about it in the subscription economy, and that is just enormous in terms of the way this continuous loop is working. And we call that the non-stop customer experience. And so when we look at uh, you know, how our company is driving satisfaction around this subscription model, it's around mapping to the non-stop customer experience continuous loop. That's how they drive this satisfaction, and that's how they sustain this growth. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another theme of the, the, the essence of the subscription economy being the customer relationship. I think that was another key theme that came out on the panel. Um, we have, I think, time for just two, maybe a couple questions, if there are any, um, in, uh, in the audience. And I think we might have some roaming mics. Are there any questions for any of the panelists? No? There must be a question. No? Yes, there is one. Bold predictions. <laughs> where, the analysts should be good at that, too. Bold predictions. Where will the subscription economy be in five years? And after that question, I'm not sure what question we could ask before we wrap this one up. We, who, who wants to take it? Ted, Dennis, do you want to take it? Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, look me up in five years. Uh, see if I was right. Uh, <laughs> we will. We will write it down. Uh, maybe I'll be it's here. Probably, it's being recorded, I hope. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. You know, one of the things about the subscription economy that uh, I've always really liked a lot, especially given the fact that it evolved during a bad recession, is that uh, subscriptions drive demand. Subscriptions make demand possible when demand by any other logical means should have been cut off. People close their, their wallets, close their pocketbooks. They weren't about to spend big bucks. And you know we saw demand destruction, um, and what what replaced it was was these subscriptions, these small companies percolating up with with you know pay us twelve thousand dollars a year instead of one hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars up front at once, and that mattered. Now um, our econ our economy is healing in in the United States. I can't say that about everywhere. And I think over the next five years, we will continue to see subscriptions as a very important part of demand generation. Moreover, um, most of the developed world, or the un underdeveloped world, is coming online now. And those folks are, are buying a lot of different things. One of the things they don't have is a great deal of capital, a great deal of money to spend on buying things whole hog. And I think in the emerging world, we're going to see a lot more reliance on subscriptions as the, the way to catapult a, a, uh, a nation, an economy, into the middle class. So that's my prediction. See me in five years. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Old prediction. So my, Chris, Christine has one, okay, too. Okay, so I think in five, well, in five years. Um, the on-premise or the enterprise sale is probably not going to go away entirely because there, there are a lot of companies who still have it and they're going to keep it and there's a hybrid model. Um, but I think it's certainly going to decline and I'm, I'm talking about sort of software, hardware kind of um, stuff. I think subscription is going to grow rapidly and part of that will be, I'll say, 
fake subscriptions, if you will, because you know, if it smells like cloud, it's it priced like cloud, it's in subscription, but it's still on premise, uh, some of that's going to be out there as well. But I think it, it'll be more of a, it's probably going to be 50-50, mm. something like that. And then I think also if you think about the consumer economy, that's also shifting. Um, subscriptions is a, in different aspects of our lives, there's a lot of stuff we subscribe to and, and more and more every year, but there's still that component where you have to, you know, you know, yeah, I happen to like owning my car, but that's my choice. A lot of people don't. I think that's going to be a higher and higher percentage, maybe even getting to that 50-50 as well. So right. there's me. She put numbers to it as well. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Any other comments? Yeah, Joel, you have one? Yeah, uh, yeah I have a quick one. So yeah. my, com my comment's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be completely obvious and completely biased uh, <laughs> after I make it, but we'll give it a shot here anyway. <laughs> um, so I really like the idea of the 24-7 customer experience. And I think that it's important for people to uh, recognize and remember, like, why do we have the subscription economy? And it's the internet. The internet is the reason we have the subscription economy because that's what allows for this 24-7 connection to the customer. So you, know, you see the subscription economy starting mostly in the SaaS space or the consumer internet space. But now you see things like Uber where it's like you know, you're, you're getting a car to pick you up and it becomes more physical. So my prediction, which is completely obvious and completely biased because this is what I do, is that the companies that really leverage the online relationship to spend more time with their customers, to interact with their customers, to monitor their customers, to optimize the experience that their customers have, they will be the most successful in the subscription economy. And that's the reason that I think you know, this group and this conference is important because a lot of the tools and things you see here are doing exactly that. Excellent. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> I, I, we, we are going to, to bring this session to a close. Um, Again, I encourage all of you to pick up a book. We have books out in the lobby. You can also download the book uh, at Zora.com, uh, where you can download a digital copy. Uh, we will also, I think all of the panelists will also be at the network reception uh, as we wrap up later today. So feel free to also approach them and, and get their predictions, the rest of them, from, uh, from the other panelists who didn't speak. So a round, a round of applause for all the panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. One of you guys, I think we're going to move on to the next session. So while the panelists exit, we have uh, one last uh, session here before we break for the networking reception. And that is um, actually one of the highlights of last year, where we uh, take an opportunity to recognize innovation among um, our customer base. And, and we've formalized this more in the, la in the last year, where we invite um, customers or others in the community to nominate um, uh, 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 nominate uh, companies for a set of innovation awards. And to present those innovation awards, I would like to welcome Todd Pearson. Where is Todd? Is he coming? To welcome Todd Pearson. Is he moment to, oh, here, ladies and gentlemen, Todd Pearson, red carpet. Wow, you have outdone yourself, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Here you go. This is important. This is really important. Here you go. It's all I yours. Don't get to, uh, I don't get to wear uh, my tuxedo very often, so I thought it would be a fun opportunity. Is there a mic? Yeah, you should. Oh, you don't have a mic? Oh, you were not mic'd. Sorry. Um, yeah, actually, can uh, do we have a hand mic, a handheld mic that we could give? OK. Do, do you mind holding a handheld mic? What's that? A handheld no, mic? No, that's fine. That might be easier. Um, You have a hand on the one? All right. It's on. I got it. On okay. No, it's, no, I got it. it's already on. I think we know. Okay. Yep. Here you go. All right. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm here. I appreciate you all. And uh, of uh, crap. Wait, Todd, it's not uh, not working well. Try it now, maybe? Now? How's that? Yep, OK. OK, so Zora is, uh, is pleased to announce the winners of our second annual
uh, subscription innovation. Turn, we give, turn my mic off, please. We give these awards um, to uh, companies to recognize those who have creatively leveraged the subscription model to build, scale, and, uh, and enhance their businesses. Um, we, we have four categories. Uh, these are for uh, subscription growth innovation, for subscription process innovation, for subscription knowledge innovation, and for overall subscription business innovation. Our, our first award uh, is for growth innovation. And, uh, and the winner is a company that has grown to over $100 million um, and accelerating. Uh, serves over 180,000 uh, companies and, um, and over 8 million users. Uh, please, uh, please help me in congratulating Box. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Okay, thank you, Andrew. That was Andrew Chapello from uh, from Box. Uh, our second award is for process innovation, and we had so many um, we had so many quality nominations for this one that um, we actually have two winners uh, for the process innovation. The first one is um, a winner in this category is for a company that provides industry leading MLS. Um, listing services and technology for real estate professionals. Please congratulate MLS listings. Um, MLS uh, has launched a full service user interface for subscribers and importantly they have, um, he hello, Jeremy, thanks for coming up. Thank I want to say a little bit about what you guys do. Um, They've launched a, a full-service um, user interface for their customers, but has also turned that inside and provided it to all of their, um, all of their employees internally uh, to give them a 360-degree view um, of the subscribers and be able to use it to run all of the billing uh, automation in, in the company. And so we thought that was pretty impressive. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. The second award for process innovation goes to a leading global provider of, um, of new world communications and is a, in a leadership position in emerging markets. Um, please well, please uh, help me in uh, congratulating Tata Communications. And hang on one second. Um, Tata introduced a disruptive um, service called BSS Evolution. And importantly, um, hello, Aditya. Thanks for coming up. Um, and uh, really importantly, this, this, this service um, tied together Zora and, uh, and Salesforce and built a platform that was able to release uh, new products in eight weeks. And they're targeting to get that down to two weeks. That might not sound like a huge amount, uh, a huge um, uh, or a really fast, rapid time for deploying products. Uh, but in this industry, it is, and in fact, this is down from uh, taking six months to deploy products before they launch this, this functionality. So it's, it's really revolutionizing their business. So um, congratulations to you, and, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next award is for knowledge innovation. This is in the measure category. Um, and this award goes to a company that makes it easy to create, send, and track great looking email campaigns. Congratulations to Emma. Yay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my team loves working with Emma because they love this system that, that Emma built. It's, uh, it's just super impressive. Um, it's um, the Emma team, I guess with Patrick at its, at its helm as uh, director of FP&A. Um, has, has just built a system with really powerful reports and dashboards that keep the business informed of both new and existing customers um, with data uh, showing analysis uh, of different markets, geographic locations, uh, revenue growth, account growth, churn rates, 
uh, top 10, top 50 customers, uh, you know, segmented, uh, segmented by, uh, by size and, and geography. And, um, and it really helps them run the business in, in an incredibly um, uh, informed way. So congratulations and thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, the last award is uh, in the category of overall subscription business innovation. And uh, here, again, we have, we have two winners. Uh, the first winner is, uh, goes to a company that is trusted by over 48 million uh, users, people worldwide, and countless enterprises, and is the global standard for e-signature. Congratulations to DocuSign. DocuSign has grown. Uh, that's great. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Thank Donald, thank you. Um, they've grown over 150% year on year, uh, and they've streamlined the processes with uh, an integration between uh, Zora and Salesforce um, that, has, um, that has enabled them to grow their, uh, their sales team by 5x. And so that, that's an enormous strain on a company operationally, and the ability to do that is really a testament. Uh, to the to the work you guys put into it, so congratulations, thank you. And the final award, also for um, overall subscription business innovation, um, goes to a fellow I think you guys have seen a fair amount of today. Not a fellow, but a, uh, a company, um, which is uh, which is NCR uh, for their NCR silver product. And this this um, thank you, Patrick. Come on up. Um, this, is, this is really impressive because it's using the power of subscriptions and the subscription economy to help um, a company. I won't go into the product again because I know you, you've all, uh, most of you probably saw um, Patrick on stage this morning um, talking about the, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, talking about uh, the, um, uh, the silver product, um, but Bill, but um, it's, um, it's really impressive to take a company that you know is has really moved in a direction and is so firmly entrenched um, in an enterprise you know uh, hardware product, and to reconnect with the huge four million plus um, long tail of um, you know of retail um, by moving into a subscription based product that brings software back into the equation. Uh, so really impressive, and uh, congratulations to you, Bill. All right. And I think that is it. Brian, is it back to you, or am I just releasing everyone to, um, to, uh, to happy, happy hour? Truly happy. Give the details of the happy hour. Uh, the details of the happy hour, if you go to the next slide, right after this, there's a networking reception on the fourth floor in the Pacific Terrace, which I think is up one floor. And you'll find the Terrace 5.30, 7.30. And then tonight, you're all invited, and you're welcome to bring a guest or a couple guests to uh, a party. And this is the wrong time, so don't confuse yourself. At the Grand at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock is the party. Networking reception, 5.30, 7.30. The party's at 8 o'clock. Thank you for a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow morning for the product keynote. Thank you. <laughs>